Hi, in this video I'll cover dropouts. The goals of this video are, first we'll quickly see what dropouts are, how they benefit us, what are the types of dropouts we have. Then we'll implement dropouts with weight constraints. Then we'll understand the concept of ability to maintain capacity despite including a dropout. And also we'll try and do an exercise of trying to find the ideal dropout ratio for your architecture. So those are the four goals. Definition of a dropout is we are going to be randomly choosing nodes in a particular layer and dropping them out, which means we are going to be removing both incoming and outgoing connections as part of that removal. So if this is our original network, if we are going to randomly choose one, two, and three of these nodes to be removed for this particular layer, then all the incoming and outgoing connections for these nodes are also removed, which means now this particular network has got a very different topology and architecture compared to the original network. What are the effects of dropouts? First, because dropouts has got a random element to it, it induces noise into the training process, forcing the nodes to learn more and co-adapt to correct for mistakes from the previous layers. This makes the model more robust. Second, dropout has been very well used in practice as a regularization method because it performs better than weight decay and activation regularization methods. Usually, when you include dropouts, you're also combining a weighting constraint as we will do today. Third, when we have dropouts in place, we are actually, in a sense, having an effect of ensemble of architectures. So, this particular example, where we have dropped three of these nodes, this is just one instance as part of the training, and there could be various other instances during the same training. So, this gives the effect of ensemble of networks, and thus, we are going to be having a more robust estimation of our overall output. We are also going to be learning sparse representations. Why? Because dropouts are simulating sparse activations from a given layer, which in turn encourages the overall network to understand sparse representations. We are going to be reducing the capacity of the network when we use these dropouts and that these nodes no more are active and this is a side effect of using dropouts and we are going to find a solution in this particular video of how to maintain the capacity as we had in the original network. One other effect of dropout are larger weights. The weights of the network are usually larger than normal because of dropouts and in implementations like Keras and PyTorch rescaling of the weights by the given dropout ratio is performed as part of the training. There are a few dropout types supported in Keras. One is the standard dropout where we are actually dropping out randomly these particular units. So this is all one units that are being dropped out. And there is one more concept called spatial dropout which is very useful in convolutional network. And the fundamental idea is you will no more just be removing one unit but you're going to be removing the entire feature map from the convolution layer which would then not get included into the pooling. This spatial dropout has got three variations. One is the one-dimensional, two-dimensional, and three-dimensional variation, depending on the dimensions of how you want to operate with your feature maps. As part of dropouts, we have been introduced a hyperparameter, which basically indicates the probability at which the output of the layers are being dropped out. So generally, this dropout probability is referred to as the dropout ratio, or the dropout rate, and is between 0 and 1. So when do we use dropouts? When you have a deep and a dense network which has a risk of overfitting or that you have more sparse network but you have a smaller data set then in these two cases usually dropouts are a good candidate to regularize. And when you include dropouts into your architecture you must also consider using weight constraints either with a unit norm or a max norm. Usually a max norm of 3 or 4 is used in the literature but I've seen that unit norm also works extremely well. And one more thing to note is if you are using batch normalization, then people generally don't tie up both batch normalization and dropouts into the same architecture unless there is an absolute need. 
One more component that I need to discuss is ability to maintain constant capacity despite including dropouts into your architecture. And this is done by adjusting the nodes in your layer on which the dropout is being implemented. The simplest linear scaling method, which is n by p units method, is, is commonly used and that's something that we'll be using in our notebook. To explain this with an example, if you have a dropout ratio of say 50%, and if you have 10 neurons in the layer in which you want to implement the dropout, then the adjusted neuron count should be 20 in your architecture so that when dropouts have been applied you still will carry 10 neuron which is equal to the capacity of your base network. Alright now let's move on and take a look at the hands-on. So from a hands-on perspective we are importing warnings, our data generator which is make blob we're getting in both the Keras dense layer and dropouts for a sequential model and we do have our standard optimizers and then certain utilities. Matplotlib for plotting and we are getting in the keras.constraints which is the max norm and unit norm. These are the two weight constraints which we want to include in. On top of the backend which we want to use for extracting activations from our architecture. From a data generator class this has uh, three functions. One is the initialization where we are calling in the make blob to generate x and y values then a train test split where we are using the n ND arrays indexing for us to extract train x, train y and text, test x, test y values. Following that we do have a plot function for us to plot each of those values for different classes in different colors. In our context we're going to use 10,000 data points and two clusters and when we instantiate our data generator class and call the plot this is what we get. And also we are running in the train test split to keep these train x, train y, test x, text y, which we'll be using later when we're running the model. The next section is the naive model class, where in the instantiation of the model, we are getting in a few details, like whether we want to apply dropouts for this architecture, what sort of a dropout rate we want to have, whether we want to have uh, dropout node adjustments continue to go with uh, constant capacity, whether we want to apply uh, weight constraints. So these have been stored in the class variables. Following that we do have the build sequential function where we are checking if uh, dropouts are necessary and if we want to maintain capacity and this is the n by p function we saw earlier of trying to update the number of neurons given the dropout rate and given the base layers number of neurons. So that is done here and what I have in the build sequential function is I have a 50 uh, neurons that's my first layer and then my second layer has got 20 neurons. So with any dropout ratio that I've chosen, I obviously will adjust these rates to ensure I'm maintaining the capacity. Then when a kernel constraint is set up or is being requested, which is nothing but the weight constraint, then I am setting up the kernel underscore constraint parameter is equal to unit norm as part of my layer. When dropouts are necessary, I'm adding in dropouts for both my layers by doing a model.add dropout and I'm passing in the percent of dropout ratio or the dropout rate that we need to do for this particular case. So I do that for both layers. That's my first layer and my second layer here. Following that I do have my output layer which is nothing but the softmax activation applied layer for the number of classes I have. Then in my fit function I'm doing a standard model.fit for train x, train y with validation test x, text, text y for the given number of epochs. Following that I'm extracting the first layer, last layer activations and first layer mean gradients, last layer mean gradients. I have already explained in my previous video on how to do the first layer, last layer activation extractions and also the mean gradient extractions. So if you haven't checked out the video the mean gradient extraction is discussed in the batch normalization video and the first layer last layer activation is explained in weight regularization video. So as part of the plotting I now have uh, seven uh, charts. First is my pox and accuracy chart that I'm plotting in the first and the last gradients following that I'm plotting in the first and the last layer activations and then my loss convergence chart which is an adjusted validation was a training loss. Then I do have my naive model factory function which is creating the model calling the build sequential on the model instance and fitting it, plotting the model. In section one, what we're going to do is we're going to do a definition of what our original model or the base model is, which is nothing but first layer with 50 neurons, second layer with 20 neurons, and the output layer with two neurons. This is our base model. 
So we are going to apply dropouts for this particular base model with and without capacity setup. So first we are going to apply it naively without worrying about capacity where my uh, dropout rate is 50 percent the rest of the parameters are just indicating uh, for my training parameters and also how I want to treat my dropouts. So let us see the output. For my base model now that I have added in dropouts uh, after each layer I obviously will get dropout layer 1 here which is for 50 neurons drop it layer 2 here which is for 20 neurons. Then I'm actually plotting in what sort of an output I got. So my epox accuracy, my gradients, my layer activations, my validation training accuracy and my loss conversions. And this is the case when my capacity has actually been reduced because of a 50% dropout ratio as part of our architecture. The next example that I'm running is where I have increased the capacity linearly using the n by p formulation that we saw earlier and as a result of it my first layer has now got not 50 neurons but 100 neurons and my second layer has got not 20 neurons but 40 neurons and then they all both have their own dropout layers my output layer continues to be with just two neurons now let us see what sort of an output we got and what we do see is generally the convergence the smoothness to validation and training accuracy continues to remain the same as what we just now saw. Even the gradients and activations don't have major changes, but what has the change is how we have learned over the box and how well we have learned here. That's the difference. Because here, within the 10th epoch, we have already reached about 77% accuracy, both for training and testing. However, here, it took us about 40 epochs for it to reach the level of 75%, and also there is a certain amount of deviation between the validation and training. So the increase in capacity definitely is working well in our favor and in fact if you note it is not just increase in capacity but we are maintaining the capacity equal to the base model by us adjusting the, the number of neurons in our architecture. Let us now move on and try and look at the second section which is the searching for the right dropout ratio with with constant capacity. So from now on we will use the constant capacity notion of us increasing the number of neurons given the number of uh, dropout ratio and that is assumed but what is the right dropout ratio so for that we have to do a grid search so in this particular case I've taken a sparse grid to, uh, to make it more computationally efficient so I've just taken five different dropout ratio values and I'm running the model through to take a look at what is the output for the dropout ratio of 10 percent I do get that the model actually reaches about 79% and it has a good amount of convergence. For a dropout ratio of 20%, I do see something very similar, but here now my first layer gradients and my last layer gradients do have some differences, primarily with respect to how they are being pillared. So there is more wider pillaring as I increase my dropout ratio. That is my first observation. And second one, there is a large dip here with respect to these distributions on the first layer gradients. So this informs us that when the gradients are passed from last layer to first layer, there's a lot more diverse numbers coming over as we have the dropouts increase. And that makes sense because the dropouts are going to induce noise into our structure and thus we can expect certain movement in the gradient. Other than that, we do see that both of them do have certain uh, convergence properties and they are looking uh, fairly smooth. When we use the dropout ratio of 40%, what we see is, number one, there are benefits with respect to how it has reached the training and testing accuracies and their convergence is much, much more smoother. And there are not that many changes in my activations nor in my uh, gradients. So 20% to 40%, there is not much of a change with respect to gradients and activations but definitely there is a little bit more smoothness that we can see from training and testing accuracies. But as I increase it to more radical numbers like 60%, I do see that there, the deviations increase between training and testing accuracy and also that these particular gradient distributions are now starting to get shrunk. So now they, I'm seeing more of the values being bounded by minus one to plus one compared to what I saw earlier, which was a slightly more broader uh, gradient structure. Then I'm, when I'm using an 80%, which is fairly a very large dropout ratio, I do see that now we are starting to underperform because we are not even reaching 70% from our training perspective. And our gradients are now starting to have a lot more multinomial or multi-Gaussian-ish nature, 
which which and which makes us appreciate the kind of noise getting into the system so if we were to choose in this particular context it would have to be somewhere either the 20% or the 40% and if I were to recommend it probably will be a 40% range that's all for this video I'll see you in the next video